So please uh, fasten your seat belts, and I would like to inform you that we have painkillers in the family room for your convenience. Sit back and enjoy the ride. We start 100 years ago in Denmark, the story of a person called Ole Kirk Christensen. He was a very poor person, but he was doing fine. His uh, father was a carpenter. He had a workshop doing uh, furniture, selling furniture, and he started working with him. He got married, had four children, and uh, he got over the, uh, the workshop himself. And the four kids got married, and then the world should got fire, 1924. But don't worry, all is uh, very innovative and uh, doesn't give up. He repaired it. Things started going back again well. He went on to sell furniture. Then the Great Depression, and uh, nobody wanted to buy furniture anymore. And if this wasn't enough, his wife died. So he was a single parent with four children with no one to buy any furniture from him. So he took the leftovers from the wood and started making wooden toys for his kids. And uh, later on, he started uh, giving them, trading them for food, to put food on the table for Christmas. He really cared for the quality of these toys and started making name for himself. And soon he started selling these toys. There was this uh, fad on uh, yo-yo that he really managed to uh, get on and make a lot of uh, uh, sales. He really cared for the quality, and instead of selling furniture, they pivoted to making wooden toys. So his kids started working with him, and he got some workers as well. So he managed to go through the Great Depression pretty nicely. This is one of his famous toys. It's a wooden duck. There's a nice story about this. His elder son was working with him, came to him one day and said, Daddy, I saved 10%. How? Instead of putting two vanish, we, uh, three vanish, I put only two layers of vanish. Uh, you know, like we do in Shutterfly. He didn't like that because he cared for quality and he was perfectionist. So he told him, go back to the delivery uh, place, take all the boxes, come back to the workshop, open them, put the extra uh, vanish, put them back and do it alone without any help from any workers. So you see how all they cared for the quality and also for teaching his son. He called the company Lego, as in play well in Danish. And things finally after the Great Depression starting going uh, really well. But then another fire broke and the whole place got damaged again. But don't worry about Ole, he rebuilt it and started selling toys again. And things were starting going well again. But then the second war started and everything went kaput. So he needed to pivot and think about what to do. Back then, plastic toys were considered as cheap. Only metal and wooden toys are good. He put all his savings into buying this plastic molding machine, which was an innovative new thing. And he used it to put uh, to make uh, uh, plastic bricks because he said there is no system in, play, in games. And so the Lego bricks was born, a game that can be innovative for kids and they can, they can use their imagination to build anything. He patented it and bricks from the uh, 30s still work with bricks that are done today. So it was a great success. And finally, things were going great. Kids really loved it. And all he passed through the Great Depression, the Second World War, being a single parent and everything. And finally, things were going well for Ole. So he died. So the Second World War ended. And the world looked pretty different after what? It was divided. Historian uh, Alfred Suave, is a French historian, wrote in an article uh, about the new world order. And he said that the world after the Second World War was divided into three worlds. The first world, the Americans and their allies. 
the Second War, the uh, Soviets and their allies, and the neutral, neutral countries, which were called the Third War. We still use the word Third World countries to say poor countries, but this is the original uh, saying of this sentence. The uh, Cold War was known for its uh, uh, proxy wars, Vietnam, the atomic bomb. But what I'm interested in and what I'm going to talk about is the space race. And uh, for both of the sides, the first world, the Americans and the Soviets, they both knew in order to be the single superpower in the world, you need to control space. Who controls space? Control Earth. In the beginning, the Soviets were having the better part. They started with the first uh, satellite, Sputnik. And a year later, followed by the first dog, Laika, and then Yuri Gagarin, the first human being in space. The Americans were very scared and very disappointed that they're not winning this race. Back then, President uh, Kennedy decided that they must invest everything in order to win this race. Now, it wasn't easy because we're talking about the uh, 50s. And he put his target as reaching the moon. So whoever lands on the moon will be the one that will win the race. And uh, in order to gain support for this, he made this his, uh, historic speech, which I hope we will hear. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this and do it right, and do it first before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That historic speech uh, really moved people, and they understood the importance of this. And he needed the uh, economic uh, backing of them. But the Americans had a problem. They needed help. Technology doesn't rise without good developers. And the help came from a very unexpected place. So during the Second World War, the Nazis had a lot of uh, engineering power, which gave them an upper hand in the beginning. They were the first to develop the first jet engines in airplanes, as well as the first ballistic missiles. So after the end of the Cold, uh, Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, there was an American operation called Operation Paperclip, which they took 1,600 Nazi scientists and engineers and took them to the United States to work with some agencies, which was one of them, the newly made National Aeronautics and Space Administration, also known as NASA. And the program that will take the human being to the moon was called the Apollo program, our parent company. And the head of that program was Werner von Braun, then one of the top Nazi scientists. So a top Nazi scientist was heading the program who landed people on Earth. So how do we get to the moon? Let's run some rocket science, shall we? You'd love to hear that from an Arab, right? So you cannot use an airplanes or helicopters to fly to space because you need air and we don't have that in space. Instead, we need a rocket. This is the rocket we're talking about. It's called the Saturn V. 
It's as high as the missile building here next to us, 111 meters, and it's beautiful. So how do rockets work? Well, Newton, the third rule of Newton, which says in one direction, if you have force in one direction, you have an equal force in the other direction. By the way, this is the first Apple company logo. So let's create a rocket together. I have here a tank with the gas inside, very, very high pressure. And if I open the valve here for the nozzle, we have a high pressure inside, lower pressure outside, we'll have a force downward. And because of Newton's third world, we'll have a force upward. So it's basically like a balloon, right? And this is, this can work. And we do use it in space. Uh, for example, for steering and stuff like that. The problem with this solution is that this is not scalable. If you want more power in order to leave the atmosphere, we need to increase the pressure. If we increase the pressure, we need to make the walls of this tank bigger, and then it will be heavier, so we can't leave the atmosphere. So non-scalable solution. Instead, we need another way to make the difference between the high and low pressure. So we can do it by using some heat. And heat we can do by chemical reaction, which is called fire. Firing, right? Yeah. So. We create fire using fuel, like in cars, but a chemical reaction doesn't happen because of one material, it needs two materials. And in cars, we use two materials, the fuel that we buy and oxygen in the air. In space, there's no oxygen, so we need oxygen. So we need two materials in order to create a, a rocket a fuel. So we have the fuel and the oxidizer. Mixed together, they create the rocket fuel. So we can have them as a solid fuel. This is called solid rockets. And this is the most ancient kind of rockets. Fireworks, right? And they are used in space. They're used as a support, you know? They're, they're very good in, you just turn them on and they go. So it's very good for missiles, like the extra missiles by Israeli government. Or my favorite, ready? the Qassam missile from Hamas in Gaza. So wondering how do uh, uh, Hamas gets uh, like uh, the fuel and the oxidizer? Israel won't let it, right? It's not fair. So, but they can do it from off-shelf products, sugar and potassium nitrate, which is a fertilizer. You can mix them together, and you have the oxidizer and the fuel. Maybe you heard this name, nitrate, specifically aluminium nitrate. About two years ago in Lebanon, in Beirut, in the uh, in the port. And nitrate, aluminum nitrate, and sugar with the heat created that explosion. This is how we create rockets. Okay, so this kind of rocket, the solid fuel rocket, also exists on this uh, as, um, rocket as well. Here it is in the very top. As you can see, this is the escape launch system, and it's a solid fuel rocket. And it has the advantages of being turned on, and it goes very quickly. The problem with solid state rockets is that you cannot control it. You cannot control the difference in power and you cannot steer. So we need different kind of rockets in order to make this work. Instead of using solid fuels, we'll use liquid ones. So we have two tanks now instead of one other thing mixed, one for the oxidizer and one for the fuel itself. So how do we mix them together? We have pipes running from the oxidizer and one from the fuel to the nozzle here, and we need a way to suck these materials inside the nozzle. So we can do it by either pressuring the tanks or by using pumps. But we need a way to make the pumps work, right? We can use uh, electricity, batteries, or we can use the already existing fuel inside the rocket and put it in a turbine and we light them up. So we have a smaller rocket inside the big rocket and we light them up they will turn the turbine, and in, in turn, the turbine itself will turn the pumps. Very simple. So you have a small rocket inside the big rocket, turning the pumps that sucks the fuel, that put it in the nozzle, and then it turns on and have the force downward. And this engine is called the F1 engine. It's the biggest ever and will ever be engine in a rocket, and it's beautiful. Uh, you see, this is the uh, nozzle itself, so all the heat comes here. It's very, very hot. It can easily, uh, um, how do you say, the metal, it will uh, melt, melt the metal, of course. So 
how do we prevent melting metals? What they did is have the pipes of the fuel that I told you about go around this nozzle in order to cool down the heat. And remember when I told you there is a small rocket inside the big rocket? Well, that rocket uh, uh, extracts gas, like in the, in the car, in the uh, exhaust. That smoke also comes here and is inputted to the, the rocket itself in order to also cool down the nozzle. And uh, Saturn V had five of those huge rockets. That's why it's the biggest rocket and most powerful rocket ever been and ever will be, because it's not as efficient as possible. This is how the nozzle looks like from the inside. You can see here this all holes. This is where the two materials get pumped and they mix together as fast as possible. This is like shower head, basically. And this is how it looks like in action. And you can see here the black smoke and this black smoke is of the small rocket inside the big rocket that creates this uh, exhaust smoke. And uh, because the fuel gets burned up so quickly in just terms of minutes, so you, when the uh, uh, tanks are empty, you want to get rid of this extra not useful waste. So you have stages in rockets. So in the Saturn V, you have three stages. And whenever one stage is empty, it's thrown away. Great, so we have the rocket, but we need a path. We need a guidance somehow to steer the rocket to go correctly around the uh, uh, Earth to go to the moon. So to do all these calculations, we need a computer. Now, this is the 50s, and this is how computer looked like back then. So you need to do the biggest innovation ever in the history of human being to get from this to this. This is the uh, Apollo guidance computer. And it's a masterpiece. So let's learn how they did it. Well, a computer is uh, basically three parts. The CPU, the memory, the RAM, what we call it, and the disk, which was then the ROM, the read-only memory. So let's see how they did it. So for the CPU, back then, all the, uh, uh, all the electrical currents used um, bulbs, uh, vacuum tubes. Back then, it was a new invention, the invention of the transistor, right? So the transistor basically is two wires, and the third wire, if it's on, it's a closed circuit. If it's off, it's not. And using that uh, the transistor, you can create anything. So you, they used 5,000 NOR gates in order to create the ALU unit, and this is the logic model of the uh, uh, computer, and it was very pioneering by, uh, back then. Next up, the memory. Memory like this didn't exist back then, so we use something else. We have something called a core, a core rope memory. So you have a magnetic uh, ring with a, a wire in it, and if you have a current in one direction, it will go clockwise. The other direction will go counterclockwise. Clockwise means one, counterclockwise means zero. And you can have them in a grid, and in that grid you put a lot of them, and you can change them by X and Y, and voila, you have a memory. This is how it looks like. So every one of them is a bit. You can actually see the bits here. And look at this beautiful photo. This is an eight gigabyte SD card today, and behind it, an eight bits. You can see eight bits here, and on top of it, an eight gigabyte. And this sheet of memory was sandwiched together as if a shawarma laffa, and then put inside the memory model of the uh, Apollo computer. So that's of the memory. What about the disk? The disk, you need much more space, and you don't have to write to it, so you can do it some other thing. Again, we take that same ring, and if the wire goes through it, it's one. If it goes around it, it's zero. So you can use the same ring with many, many, many wires as much as you can fit. And you end up with something like this. And if you, uh, you want to see how they put them together, it's like this. So it's like a sewing. And uh, th they called it the LOL memory. Not laughing out loud, but little old ladies. And the reason is because women did it. So here you see women. And what they're doing is they're wiring the code. So they had the software, which I'll talk about in a second. And this woman, what they're actually doing is hard coding the software into hardware, exactly like the Android team here in Shutterfly. 
So you can see the full computer being built. It's uh, 32 kilo, kilograms, 55 watts. And you can see how many uh, kilo, uh, words it has. So only 2,000 integers, right? It could hold in the memory. So imagine what they could do with so much little memory. Imagine what we can do with the huge memory we have today. Anyway, that was the hardware. The software was uh, partly done by uh, Margaret Hamilton. And you can see her here working. And this is the source code of the, uh, uh, the Apollo launch mission. You see they were used to print them. And if you open the book, it will be an open source. The code itself is pretty interesting. It's right, it's in assembly, and they have some weird comments there. You see, like this is temporary. I hope, hope, hope. This reminds me of the comments we have from 2016. Fix this tomorrow. The code is available on GitHub if you'd like to see all the funny comments, and it already have some pull requests. Too late for that, I guess. So we have the hardware, we have the software, we have the rocket. We have the three beautiful astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, and we're ready. So I prepared for you a beautiful movie because this is, in my opinion, not just a journey. This is the human masterpiece. What happened since? The Cold War ended with the fall of the Soviet Union, and with it ended the space race. The Apollo missions continued for uh, six total missions, and until uh, uh, Apollo 17, they managed to even get a vehicle up there to explore the moon in full. All the rocks were brought to Earth, and now they're in the labs, and people are still doing science for the, uh, uh, using them till this day. We know a lot about the moon just from these explorations. I was recently in Vienna and in the National History Museum, I saw the gift that the United States gave to all countries with a small rock from the moon. 
as well as some of the uh, orange glass that was found there that showed that there was an, a, a volcanic activity a long time ago in the moon. So it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, YouTubers managed to get hold of this uh, computer. They restored it and managed to simulate landing on the moon using it again. It was uh, really beautiful to see. The NASA space program ended the, the Apollo program, and instead there was the space shuttle, which was also later ended, and the future is private. Uh, so a lot of companies like uh, SpaceX and others are uh, now competing to get us to the moon, maybe in a couple of years, and with eyes to Mars. And the Lego, well, Ole died, and his son took over. And then his son died, and his grandkid took over. This is his grandkid today, and Lego is one of the biggest toy companies in the world, doing only one product, and it's very, very uh, successful. Uh, Lego fans like myself have grown up, maybe not me, but yeah, and they created some. And of course. What you can see already here, the um, the Saturn V. It's a beautiful thing. I played it with my kids, and my kids really love it. Nino, what is this? Okay. Where does it go? The moon. The moon. Yeah. So this is my, my youngest. He's two years old. He loves space and science and exploration just because of this toy, and his name is Neil. So my point is, I know uh, like everything I talked about here today, I learned because I bought this and played with it. I didn't know any of it before. And it was just a really good experience. So I know you think like this is toys and toys are for kids and you're grown up, you have important stuff like having meetings where you set up another meetings with eight people only. But my advice to you is this, play, enjoy, and you'll be amazed with what you will learn. Thank you.